Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight is a very special night, especially for our dear students who have been looking forward to this once-in-a-lifetime event of their seminary journey. COVID-19 may have hindered us from gathering face-to-face, -face, but it can never stop us from celebrating milestone after milestone. Commissioning, as defined by the English Dictionary, is the act of granting certain powers or the authority to carry out a particular task or duty. To commission is to formally choose someone to do a special piece of work or ministry. And to be commissioned is a special privilege given to deserving individuals who will be sent out for a one-year field internship. Tonight, let us witness the virtual commissioning service of the Seraphim class with the theme, Standing Firm. To start with, may I call in Reverend Alduin C. Villagracia, Program Head for Bachelor of Arts in Theology, for the call to worship, to be followed by the invocation to be led by the Higher Education Department Head, Reverend Modesto Biolango III. Good evening, everyone. As we worship God, let me read to you a passage from the book of Psalm 105, verses 1 to 4. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make His deeds known among the peoples, sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wonders, boast in His holy name. May the heart of those who seek the Lord be joyful. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. These are God's very words. Let's bow down our heads as we welcome the presence of our Lord God Almighty. Let's pray. Our triune God, in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we invoke your presence tonight. We look up to you in times such as this because we know that it is only by your grace that we are able to reach this far as an institution. We pour out all our thanksgiving and praise to your name. We thank you for guiding our students. Thank you for preserving their lives. Thank you for pouring out strength and resources to our dear parents as well. Thank you for extending patience and grace to our dedicated teachers. This commissioning ceremony is your victory, O Lord. May you come and inhabit the praises of your people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To formally welcome us to this momentous event, may I call in our very own resident director, Reverend Ricky E. Lagare, for the welcome address. To the Ebenezer Bible College and Seminary Incorporated President, Dr. Richard C. Rojas, the management team, division heads, faculty and staff, good evening. Internship, this is an exciting learning experience, an opportunity to explore new learnings, develop new skills, and bring new ideas to the church. It is of every student's desire to be commissioned when you try to scan on Facebook, you can see the delight of the students and people are also excited for them, excited about how God will open doors of opportunity for them to learn and influence people in the church. And these opportunities will even more build a strong found ministry foundation. Today, we are all here not just to witness them being commissioned, but to join with them in worshiping the Lord with joy and gratitude for the years of molding and equipping them to be ready for the ministry. We are here not just to show our support, but because we are dedicating ourselves to journey with them for a year of God's refining process through their internship. By that, I praise the Lord for your accountability and commitment for these students, the commitment to pray for them, to counsel them, to rebuke, and to rejoice with them. This time, let us rejoice and at the same time experience God's presence. 
Welcome to the virtual commissioning service for Seraphim class. Thank you, Reverend Lagare. Listening to and soaking in the Word of God is an integral part of every believer's life. Tonight, we are blessed to be ministered to by God's servant. At this juncture, may we have Mr. Neil Dave E. Baliling, President of the Seraphim class, to formally introduce our guest speaker. Good evening, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be given the task to introduce our guest speaker for this event. He is an alumnus of this institution, Ebenezer Bible College and Seminary, Incorporated, Batch 2004. After a few years, he graduated from International Graduate School of Leadership with a degree of Masters of Divinity. Presently, he is finishing his Doctor in Ministry at Asbury Theological Seminary. He is the pulpit minister of Zamboanga City Alliance Evangelical Church. He also serves as a part-time faculty here in Ebenezer. He is married to Mrs. Beverly Marasian, and they are blessed with two wonderful kids. Without further ado, please help me welcome our speaker for tonight, a good husband, a father, a mentor, a teacher, a friend, a faithful servant of our Lord, Reverend Edelberto Marasigan, Jr. Hello, a blessed day to everyone. I am grateful to the Lord that He has allowed me to share to you His very word this day in this momentous occasion of your life. And I am praying that He's going to open our hearts and our minds to His word that we may understand what He wants us to understand and that you will be able to apply it and I will be able to apply it in my life and ministry in particular. You will be commissioned and I am praying that whatever you would learn out of this word of the Lord this very moment, you will bring this out in application or as an application in your ministry that God would be giving to you when you will be sent out there. So let us open our Bibles in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. I have chosen the New American Standard Bible 1995 edition because it is more faithful to the Greek text. So let us look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. It says here, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. May the good Lord bless the reading of His word. A few years ago, I was confronted by two religious leaders that came from other religious worldview. They wanted to join a Bible study or the, a marketplace ministry that we have established, a certain restaurant near Southern City College back then. And they went there and visited. They wanted to join the Bible study. And because I wasn't familiar of this kind of setting, that religious leaders from other groups would come and join, I consulted one person, a pastor also, who is into this kind of ministry. And I asked him, Pastor, there are people from other religious groups who want to join in this Bible study that I have been conducting in this ministry that I am in, in this particular restaurant. And he said, Pastor, don't allow them to join because the possibility, based on my experience, is that they wouldn't only be there to ask questions and learn from you, but they would be there with the intention of actually confusing the minds of the people that you are helping understand and grow in the word of the Lord. He said, if they really want to converse with you, if they really want to have a dialogue with you, then make an appointment or tell them to make an appointment with you. And so I related this to those individuals who wanted to, to, to join the, the, the group that I'm ministering with. And they said, okay, well, let's have a debate. And I said, I don't like having a debate, but I am open for a dialogue. Because to me, it is more productive if we have a dialogue because we can have a more meaningful conversation that is not so much focused and driven by the emotions. So we were there, we sat over a cup of coffee, 
two of them were confronting me. And the disadvantage that I had that time was that I did not have the luxury of time to think about my answers and to give to them the question because one person raised a question to me and I was answering the question while I was doing that. The other person was thinking another question that would be raised to me. And so at the end of our conversation, these two individuals from the different religious group said, Pastor, what can you say about the arguments that we presented to you? And I told them, and also what can you say about the arguments that I have presented to you? And they said, well, we cannot embrace what you are saying because for us, what we are upholding is the one that is true and what you have is false. And I said, I cannot also embrace what you are trying to convince me to embrace because in the first place, if I am going to look at the ancient document that you are holding on as a basis for the belief that you are teaching, when I look at this ancient document that you base your belief, its historicity is not that reliable. In contrast with the Holy Bible, the scriptures that I am having on, in contrast to this document, it is historically accurate than your document. And thus, if my document is more accurate than your document, why would I believe then in the teachings according to that document that you are holding on? The historicity of the scriptures is something that is so important that we need to look at it and embrace the scriptures, take it as the very reason why we will embrace the word of the Lord. In those days, in the time of the Apostle Paul, Paul was presenting to them the gospel. If you look at the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, you would see there that it is actually talking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul framed the issue about the resurrection within the picture of the Gospels presented in the form of events in verses 3 to 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let us look at that, those verses. In verses 3 to 4, Paul said, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Three events that were mentioned here. In presenting the Gospel, Paul considered these three events within the context of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. The first event is that Jesus Christ died. The second was that Jesus Christ was buried. And the third one was Jesus Christ was raised. Was raised back to life. Now, the first two events were embraced by the people back then. It was even embraced by the church. There was no problem about the issue about, there was no issue about the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. According to um, Gordon Fee, the writings of the book of the first Corinthians could be dated way back 53 or between 53 and 54 AD or AD 53 and AD 54. And then according to Harold Honer, if you look at the date of the crucifixion or the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can trace it between 26, AD 26 and AD 36. So I want us to look at the interval between the death and the, the death of Jesus and the writing of the first Corinthians. It was just very close. It, uh, it was within 50 years, less than 50 years. Again, the death of Jesus happened between 26 and 36 AD. And the writing of the first Corinthians happened between 53 and 54 AD. This gives us the idea that the, the event and the writing, the death and the writing were so close that the people, when Paul wrote this letter, some of them were already living by the time when Jesus Christ was crucified. It was open to the public during the Roman time when Jesus was crucified. It was open to everyone to watch. It was something that wasn't hidden to anybody. It was a public event that anybody who would want to witness the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus can see it. Many people back then saw the crucifixion. And I believe many of them also were informed about the burial of Jesus. If Jesus died naturally, the event of the burial would happen after that. But, but, the resurrection, 
that did not that did not happen in a very public way the way the crucifixion took place the burial wasn't questioned here why because if one person dies if death is already assumed then the burial is assumed to happen to take place after the death however the resurrection is something that does not happen after burial in fact there was no resurrection that happened after burial except when jesus christ raised lazarus but this time jesus himself was crucified he was buried and he was raised back to life the issue at question uh, the issue questioned here is about the resurrection and paul framed it within the gospel events which he said it should be seen from the perspective of the burial at uh, the death the burial and the resurrection and after stating that in verses 3 and 4 he continued using repeatedly the words he appeared now i want to take note of the rep repeated word here he appeared appeared why because paul used that as a as an evidence as an evidence that the resurrection of the lord jesus christ is a historical event as i have mentioned to you earlier if an event is not a historical event then meaning meaning it's not it's not real it's not true it is something questionable if the document by which the belief system of those religious leaders that i converse with is not historical or a question in its historicity then why would i believe in that document why would i believe in the doctrines in the same sense if the resurrection of jesus is not a historical event then the entire christian movement is also a question but this time the apostle paul was trying to defend the historicity of the resurrection of jesus thus after he framed it within the events of the gospel jesus died jesus was buried he was raised and it was followed by the, the rep repeated mention of the word appeared because that was presented as an evidence of the historicity of the resurrection of the lord jesus christ and he proceeded further after saying that uh, after stating those words repeatedly mentioned re he appeared as an evidence to the resurrection of jesus he mentioned also several hypothetical arguments here i want us to look at those verses or those statements beginning with verse 12 look at that deductive reasoning that he employed in this chapter of the first corinthians he said verse 12 now if take note of the word if now if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead the preaching of the lord jesus christ's resurrection now would show something and then he said but if there is no resurrection on the dead repeatedly mentioned also with these hypothetical arguments that he mentioned about the resurrection of jesus so if you look at the entirety of the 15th chapter of the book of first corinthians it is actually talking about the resurrection paul was proving to his readers that the resurrection of jesus is a sure thing that the resurrection of jesus was a historical event so it was on that premise that the encouragement or the statement i mean that he mentioned in verse 58 was standing again let's read verse 58 with that understanding now the gospel is something that you and i must embrace because jesus christ died he was buried and he was raised back to life and that reason uh, that resurrection event is a sure thing so that therefore the entire gospel is something that you and i can trust something that you and i can embrace something that you and i can take as a fact and live our lives according to it thus if we have that kind of understanding what he stated in verse 58 now becomes a lot clearer it says here therefore therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast immovable 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. The premise of this statement is standing on the fact that the resurrection was a historical event. And thus, that historical event is taken within the frame of the gospel. Jesus Christ died for your sins and my sins. He was buried and yet he did not remain at the grave. He was raised back to life. And because he is risen back to life, then you and I can expect something out of it. If he was, he, if he was risen, then those who put their faith on him, we will also be brought back to life. That, sure, uh, that certainty of the events in the past is something that the believers today should embrace. That is why the Apostle Paul is telling, urging this idea. The main statement in verse 58 is this, be steadfast, immovable. Be steadfast, immovable. And I was surprised when, you, when I look at the Greek text, I look at these two words, the adjectives here, steadfast and immovable. Steadfast, edraios, which also gives us the meaning, an idea of being firm. And when you look at the, the, the second word, immovable, ametakinetos, it also gives the idea of being firm. So the Apostle Paul used these two adjectives to give more emphasis a strong emphasis to the believers, not only to the believers, especially to the believers within the church of Corinth, that you stay strong, stay firm in that belief that you have on the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he was raised back to life. Do not allow any heresy to come to you and move and shake your faith. Stay within that gospel that you receive. He embraced that in your life. And he added, elaborated further on that be steadfast, immovable. He gave two participles. The first participle that he mentioned here is always abounding in the work of the Lord. This is an orientation of the person who has embraced the gospel. You are immovable. You are you are firm, but you are not there just sitting down. Because if you are firm and immovable, then there is an assumption that behind your mind, the gospel is the truth. Jesus Christ died. He was buried. He was raised back to life. There is a certainty in that message that God has entrusted to you. Therefore, move the orientation in the minds of the believers is not only in the behavioral aspect. When Paul wrote this down, it wasn't in the behavioral aspect. What he was telling here is that it has an orientation of an action. Not only behavior, but action. He wanted the believers to always abound. When you see the word abound, it pertains to an idea that you are not only giving or uh, sharing what is expected, but you do something what is beyond that is expected. My friends, you are going to be commissioned. This is the time that you are formally going to be commissioned. You will be sent by the Lord. I am praying that in your heart and in your mind, you will stand firm. You will remain steadfast and immovable about the truth that is preached in the word of God. Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he was risen back to life. Embrace that. And because of the certainty of the truth that you have, move. Do not just stay inside your personage, doing nothing, playing games only. Go and work for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there is, there is a truth that you bring. And I tell you, when you do that, you bring glory and honor to the one who commissioned you. And Paul added with another, another participle here saying, knowing that your vain or knowing that your toil in the Lord is not in vain. You do not, Paul is not only giving an orientation, not a behavioral one, but an action. An orientation of an action of the one who embraced the gospel. 
but he is also giving here an, a, an inspiration, not only an orientation, but an inspiration of every person that is sent by the Lord Jesus. Because whatever you do for your master, he will always take account for it. Yes, your supervisor may overlook what you are doing. The people around you may not really appreciate what you will be doing in a form of ministry. The people may overlook the things that you are doing, but your master, the Lord who commissioned you, will never overlook anything that you have done for his kingdom and for his glory. That is why my brother and sisters, brothers and sisters, interns, you will be commissioned. Move when you are there already. Act. Live your life for the gospel. I would like to close this message with a story that I have heard from another preacher before. There was one time a missionary to, who went to Africa. He was there for several years. He lived among the people there. One time, he was just strolling along the river. When suddenly he saw a child trying to cross the river. The problem was that the water was flowing um, strongly. And the child was not strong enough and heavy enough to make it to the other side. And so the child was there in the middle of the river already struggling. The missionary saw this boy. And he, without any second thought, he went to the boy and offered some help. Successfully, the missionary was able to bring back the boy to the side. And so the missionary told him, now you are safe, you go back home. And then he turned his back to the child and went forward. But he noticed a few steps later, he noticed that the child was there at his back. So he stopped walking and he looked behind him. The child was there. He told the child, you go home. The child remained silent. He didn't say anything. And the missionary told him, you go home. Go back to your family. Go back to your mom and dad. Maybe they're looking for you already. And then he continued walking. As he took some steps, the boy also took some steps. He stepped one, two, three. The boy also did the same. One, two, three. And so the distance was just the same. He stopped walking and then turned around again. And he saw the boy boy. The same distance from him as it was before. And so he told the boy, go home, move, shoo, 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 go back to your family. But the boy didn't move. The boy didn't say anything. So he decided to walk to the captain of the village or to the chieftain of the village. He walked and the boy was following him. When he arrived at that house, he said to the chieftain, sir, I have a problem. And then the chieftain said, you may speak. Tell me your problem. I could be a help to you also. And so the missionary told him, I was just walking along the river earlier and I saw this boy behind me, this boy. I saw this boy trying to cross, but he was struggling for his life when he was there at the middle. And so I did not hesitate. I helped him and took him back to the side of the river. But since that time, he never stopped following me. I wanted and I told him to go back to his family, but he never stopped following me. I am getting annoyed of this guy already. And the chieftain just smiled at him. And he said, you know, in our culture, once our life is endangered and someone comes to rescue us, we consider that our first life is already gone. This after the intervention, after the help that you have offered. In our culture, we, we take it as a second life. And because you were the one who helped the boy in his mind, his life no longer belongs to him, but his life belongs to you. It is not the culture that we have here in our country. But I tell you, it is a reality that we can see in the scriptures the word of the Lord tells you and me that we have been saved, saved and justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That can only happen because Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he was risen back to life. And because of that, we are safe, not only in our current time, 
but we are safe in the arms of Jesus, even in the perspective of eternity. Your life, my life, in that culture, no longer belongs to us. Your life belongs to your master. And I am urging every one of you, as you will be commissioned, as you will be sent, embrace that gospel that you have learned from your professors, from the word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and live your lives abounding always in the work of that gospel. Because your master who called you, who commissioned you, will never forget and will never overlook what you will do for him and for his glory. I would like to congratulate every one of you. And I would like to say, may the Spirit of God empower you all the more as you will be sent to do the ministry of the gospel in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless us all.
has made it difficult for us to assign our outgoing interns to different places of ministries. As much as we desire to partner with different Kamakop churches, we are unable to do so because of the limitations set by the government. But despite all that, we praise the Lord for giving our outgoing interns the opportunity to be able to minister to their home churches and families. Let us witness a video presentation for our interns places of assignments. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure our outgoing interns are excited to start their ministries and partnerships with their assigned churches and senior pastors. To formally commission and consecrate these outgoing interns, may I call in our school president, Dr. Richard C. Rojas. At this point, I would like to request the Seraphim class to kneel down. I would also request the pastor of each intern, together with their parents or husband, to stand behind them and stretch their hands towards the intern so that together we shall bless them in prayer. Seraphim class, there is no doubt in our minds that God has called you and prepared you for the ministry. So today on this solemn occasion, Ebenezer is officially sending you out as senior interns. You will serve as the catalyst for Christ in society. You will join a network of Christ-transformed servant leaders, fulfilling the Great Commission for the glory of God. With this, I charge you by the enabling grace of God through the Holy Spirit to be men and women who shall not only ascertain but seek to obey and fulfill God's will for your life and ministry. 
who need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of God, who shall not allow anyone to despise you just because you are young, but will try by God's grace to be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity, who shall uphold the word or indeed the ideals of Ebenezer Bible College and Seminary in particular, and the Kamakop distinctives in general, who shall put the interest of God and His work above your own. And finally, as your batch name suggests, Seraphim, which bears the idea of burning passion for God, I charge you to be loyal to God who has called you and now is sending you. Seek Him, love Him, serve Him, and worship Him with all passion and all your being. And now, will you pledge before God, your parents and pastors, that you will faithfully fulfill these things by the help and wisdom of God? And in every grace and strength of the Almighty God, through the Holy Spirit, we will. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for calling these interns, as well as everyone, Lord, who has been serving you in the ministry. We thank you, God, for the opportunity of serving our holy God. And today, as an institution, Lord, we join our hearts together with faith in you, Lord, in sending these interns to the ministry. For a year, they will serve you, Lord. For a year, they will seek to love you, to honor you, to serve you and worship you with all passion and all their beings. And Lord, I pray that in every aspect of their lives, that they will grow deeper in their love for you and their passion for the ministry and for the people whom you have called, Lord, to be ministered by these interns. And so today we send them, Lord, with much prayer in our hearts and faith as well, that you will use them powerfully and mightily for your glory in touching lives, in becoming part of the transformation of the lives of many people, and becoming agents of change for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. To you, our outgoing interns for school year 2021-2022, our prayers is that you will stand up, and not only that, you will be standing firm for Jesus in your battle, and be reminded that the battle in the ministry is of God's. Let us sing the hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, requesting all together to sing the first stanza, all the ladies to sing the second, and all the men for the third stanza. And for the fourth stanza, all of us will sing together.
Heavenly Father, we praise you for your faithfulness, especially in the lives of the seraphim class. I pray that in this next chapter of their lives, they will always abound in love for God and each other. With your grace, they will not grow weary in doing good. Bless them, O Lord, and make them a channel of your blessings and love. Dismiss us with your blessings tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations, our dear interns. It is our prayer and desire that the Lord will use you mightily. Your actions and movements may be limited by the COVID restrictions, but always remember God's ways are limitless and that He works in ways we cannot see. Stand firm. Always remember that when God calls, He enables, and that He will and He can use you for His greater glory and honor. At this point, our commissioning service has come to an end. I would like to thank everyone who joined us virtually tonight and made this event more meaningful for our dear interns. To their parents, families, pastors, thank you so much. To all our students, thank you for your presence. To the internship committee, thank you for all your labor and hard work. To every program participant who willingly gave their time for this event to be possible, maraming maraming salamat po. Your labor in the Lord will never be in vain. This has been Annie Rose A. Payot Labajo. May the Lord bless us all and may we all have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>